Again, welcome to all, and uh, let's pray together, shall we? God, we're thankful for another opportunity to uh, uh, open that ancient word that turns out to be so amazingly contemporary. Uh, we pray that uh, tonight might speak to all of us in ways unique, but also relevant to the times in which we live. Uh, thank you for Dr. Toole's scholarship and his willing to share that with us now. For all this and so much more, we offer that thanks in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Steve, it's all yours and thanks again. Oh, bless your heart, Bill. It's uh, thank you all very much for inviting me into uh, into your homes <laughs> and onto your screens. It's uh, my joy to have this opportunity to share with you and learn with you. Um, before uh, we all came together, uh, Matt, who had to be off for a deacon's meeting, posted in the chat window a link to the recording for last week. So if you know people that were unable to come last week, um, they can go to this link and see the recording from last week's lesson. The link for this week's lesson will also be posted. Uh, I'm not sure if he was going to get to that later tonight or tomorrow, but uh, that information will be shared with us. So you'll be able, if you if you need, I, I know Harry has to go off to a meeting early on too. So if you need to pop out, these are being recorded. So you can view them again or view them for the first time, share them with other folk. Um, it's... Uh, one of the real excitements about uh, possibilities that the technology opens up to us and that we are learning about really, thanks to this current uh, emergency that compels us to think differently. I've shared with several of my students and dear friends, you know, I grew up saying, you know, the church is in the building and hearing people say, you know, the church is in the building. We sing the little song, the church is not a building, the church is not a steeple. It's astonishing to discover that it's true. <laughs> it is actually true that we can discover ourselves as the body of Christ. We can find ourselves joined by the spirit. Uh, we miss, oh my goodness, we miss the opportunity to be together in person and those chances will come again. But we're learning skills that uh, perhaps we had not had to learn before, that we will continue to be able to use in days to come. Let me share my screen. Do you all see a slide? Outstanding. Mm -hmm. I see Bill's thumbs up and numerous nods. Good stuff. We're talking about Bible and babble, racial justice and diversity in Genesis 11, 1 through 9, which is the Babel story. Um, what I grew up calling and uh, still called until very recently, the Tower of Babel, a story of the Tower of Babel. Last week, we looked at chapter 11, those first nine verses, reading closely guided by Theodore Hebert in particular, and realized that the tower really isn't what the story is about. What the story is about is our human desire to be in homogeneous groups, to be all together, 
with one language and the same words. They built the city with its tower so that they would not be dispersed throughout the earth. We suggested last time, though, that God's purpose, God's intent, God's dream for humanity is not realized by homogeneity. <laughs> it's not realized by bland sameness. God calls us to celebrate and learn from our differences. And God's intent was what God actually winds up compelling us to do in this ancient story, to disperse ourselves throughout the world. Now, what we're going to do tonight is test that theory, test that hypothesis by looking at a couple of passages that come before Genesis 11 to see if they bear out that idea that God's intent is diversity and human filling the earth. Uh, we're going to be looking at Genesis 1 tonight in some detail and also looking at Genesis 10, which is one of the passages that if you ever uh, try to just read straight through the Bible, some of us have taken on that challenge at different times to read the Bible in a year. Uh, you know, chapter 10 of Genesis is one of the places where people inevitably shipwreck. Because it's just a list. Oh, it's a long list of barely pronounceable names. But we're going to think about that list tonight and what it may suggest about God's desire, God's intent, God's dream for human being. But we're starting with Genesis chapter 1. Oh my goodness, friends. There is so much we could say about this chapter. And uh, we are going to touch on just a wee piece of it. But I, I want to focus this evening particularly on the accounts of the creation of life, the creation of living things in Genesis 1. So we're going to be looking at day 3, day 5, and day 6 tonight in Genesis 1. But to set the stage, let me just briefly remind you of what happens in the first three days of creation. Day one, God's first act of creation is light. God calls light into being, and God divides the light from the dark, naming them day and night. And there was evening and there was morning, day one. The next two days, the first three days of the account in Genesis 1, all involve acts of separation. So just as on day one, God separates the light from the dark, so on day two, God inserts the solid bowl of the sky into the waters of chaos, dividing them into the water above and the water below. And on day three, God performs two creative acts. First, God separates the land from the water. God calls the land to emerge out of the water, assigns the waters their place and the land its place. And that brings us to where we're going to commence this evening with Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. Again, we're following along here in the Common English Bible, which is a contemporary translation done by a, a, a bewilderingly ecumenical uh, 
body of translators, which I often find very evocative and a little bit. Uh, Study Genesis 1 verses 11 through 13. Um, excuse me, is everyone muted? Uh, if you have not muted your microphone, would you please do that? We're getting a lot of noise through the... Oh, bless your heart. There we go. Genesis 1.11 and follow. God said, let the earth grow plant life. <laughs> I like the way that's phrased. God calls upon the earth to, to put forth plants. Let the earth grow plant life, plants yielding seeds and fruit trees bearing fruit with seeds inside it, each according to its kind throughout the earth. I want you to notice, friends, that God does not say, first of all, let there be plants. <laughs> the way that God had called light into being by speaking light's name, let there be light, or in Hebrew. God speaks to the earth and invites the earth to bring forth living things, to bring forth plants. But also God does not create generically. God does not say to the earth, you know, bring forth plants. God calls for the earth to bring forth a variety of plants, a variety of plants, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit with seeds inside it, each according to its kind. I've highlighted that phrase here. We're going to see it repeated in this first chapter. So God creates a variety of kinds of plants. The diversity of the green world shows itself in the fact that there are different kinds of tree, different kinds of shrub, different kinds of flowers. Plants bearing seeds, fruit trees bearing fruit with the seeds inside it, each according to its kind throughout the earth. And that's what happened. The earth produced plant life. Plants yielding seed, each according to its kind. Trees bearing fruit with seeds inside it, each according to its kind. God saw how good it was. It was evening, it was morning, the third day. So day three comes to a con conclusion with a world that looks like our world. There are deserts and jungles and savannas. There are rivers and lakes and oceans. It is a world that looks like our world. It, and it is already full of life, green life, plant life of a variety of kinds. But it remains a silent world. And apart from the plants, an empty world. What's going to happen on the next three days of creation, as they are described here in the first chapter of Genesis, is that God is going to populate this empty world. God is going to fill this stage. And God begins on day four by populating the hitherto blank and empty dome of the sky. There is an artistry to the careful pattern and structure evident in Genesis 1. Day 1, remember, God created light. Light. And now, on day 4, God creates light. Lights, lights. Uh, the word for light in Hebrew is or. The word that's used here is meorot. Lights, things that glow. <clears throat> God populates the daytime sky with 
the huge light of the sun. God populates the nighttime sky with the scattering of stars and the light, the lesser light, but still the beautiful, the glorious light of the moon. So day one is echoed by day four. The same thing happens with day five. On day two, remember, God had inserted the solid bowl of the sky into the roiling waters of chaos. And now there is sky above, water below, air beneath the dome of the heavens. So now on day five, God is going to populate that space under the dome, in the air, in the sky, and God is going to populate the waters. God said, let the waters swarm with living things. Note again, I, and I, I find this, I, uh, I, I don't want to uh, keep chasing rabbits is what my... Uh, my dear friend and uh, and uh, mentor Dean McBride used to tell me, Steve, you're chasing rabbits again. Uh, but this is a fascinating point to me. It is, you know, obviously we're a long, long way from the from biology, from the theory of evolution. But note how God is working. God empowered the earth to bring forth life, to bring forth the plants. And God empowered the plants with generativity, each, with, each plant with the seed and its fruit after its kind, so that they can continue to replenish and populate the earth. So God is empowering the world to participate in its own creation. <coughs> Excuse me. So here on day five, God said, let the waters swarm with living things and let birds fly above the earth, up in the dome of the sky. God created the great sea animals I guess this is an unfortunate translation, actually. Uh, the Hebrew is Tananim, which means dragon. <laughs> God created the sea monsters. And everything else that swims in the water, all the tiny living things that swarm in the waters, each note that phrase again, each according to its kind. Oh, uh, I, I love this picture, and uh, you can find ones like it all over the place. One of the things my family's been doing, perhaps like your families during the pandemic, is a lot of puzzles. And one puzzle we worked on for a long, long time was a puzzle showing a scene like this. A, bear, a reef with the waters filled with fish. Look at the colors. Look at the shapes. Each according to its kind. And good heavens, uh, up in the air, the air is now loud with bird song filled with the colors of the birds, all the winged birds, each according to its kind. God saw how good it was. God blessed them. Be fertile, multiply, fill the waters and the seas. Let the birds multiply on the earth. There was evening, there was morning, the fifth. So the world is filling now with life. 
First the green world, the plants, at the end of day three. Now on day five, the air filled with bird song, the waters swarming with living creatures, <laughs> even including the monster, the sea monster. Ancient peoples, many ancient peoples, believed that the world came into being through a battle between the creator god and chaos. Chaos symbolized as a monster, the sea monster. In old Babylon, her name was Tiamat, which means salt water in a cave. Um, but in Genesis 1, there is no battle. There is no conflict. And the priests setting forth this glorious account of the pattern and structure of reality say, okay, what about the sea monster? Is there a sea monster? Well, maybe there is. Maybe there is. But if there is, it's a big fish. <laughs> it's a creation of the divine. It isn't any power opposed to the divine. There is no power that could be opposed to the divine. So the waters are filled with living things, each according to its kind. The air is filled with living things, the birds, each according to its kind. Now we come to day six. Remember that day three, there were two acts of creation. God, first of all, had called the land to emerge from the water, assigned the waters their place, and God secondly, and this was the part we looked at in Genesis 1.11 and following, God had called upon the earth, the dry land, to bring forth life, to bring forth the green world, the plant world. Two distinct acts of creation on day three. Day six, which parallels day three, is structured the same way. Just as on day three, God had called upon the earth to put forth plants. So now, God calls upon the earth again. God empowers God's creation with generativity again. God says, let the earth produce every kind of living thing. Now, I've, I've mentioned that Genesis 1 reflects a priestly worldview. And this is one of the places that that priestly worldview is very much in evidence. The priests had a sense of the world as carefully ordered with a place for everything and everything belonging in its place. And that's one of the reasons, that's the, the motivation behind many of the regulations about clean and unclean. And for that matter, about the holy, that which belongs to God, and the common, that which belongs to humanity. In, uh, in the priestly worldview, things belong in their proper place. And for the priests, there are three kinds of animals. <laughs> three kinds of animals. And here they are. Genesis 124. Uh, in the Hebrew, it is uh, Bahema. That's domestic animals, domestic animals, behema. Hayato eretz, creatures of the earth. Uh, frequently, this is expressed as chayet uh, sadeh, uh, creatures of the field. It is wild animals, wild animals. Domestic animals share the human world. Wild animals do not. 
Domestic animals belong with humans in a civilized space. Wild animals are a threat. They stand outside civilized space. Uh, the common English Bible translates behema as livestock. I like that. And chayeto eretz as wildlife. So domestic animals, wildlife, and the in-between category are the remes. The remes. Remes uh, is... Uh, the uh, Common English Bible translates it as crawling thing. That'll do. Uh, remes have too many legs or not enough legs. Uh, remes are the things that share our human world, but we wish they didn't. <laughs> uh, remes are mosquitoes. Remes are flies. Remes are snakes and lizards. Remes are slugs and snails. Remes are those things that uh, <laughs> we wish were not part of the domestic world, but doggone it, they remain part of our world too. So the three kinds of animals, according to the priestly worldview, are domestic animals, wild animals, and creepy crawlies. And all three of them, this text says, are created by God, every kind, note, every kind of living thing. God said, let's let the earth produce life of every kind. And that's what happened. God made every kind of wildlife every kind of livestock, every kind of creature that crawls on the ground, and God saw how good it was. So the first creative act on day six is the creation of land animals in their three varieties, livestock, crawling things, and wild. But note that while there are three categories of living thing, according to the priests, they were surely aware, certainly aware, definitely aware, that within each of those three categories, there were a whole host of kinds. Good heavens. Goats, sheep, cows, oxen, horses. They knew that domestic animals were of various and sundry and wonderfully different kinds. Uh, whenever I get to this with my students, I, I often realize that for most of us, uh, we don't have much to do with domestic animals, apart from pets. Uh, you know, our cats and our dogs, they, they share the human world. They would be... Uh, Bahema in this priestly rendering. So that's the first creative fact on this sixth day. What's the second? Verse 26. Then God said, and we talked about this last time, remember, because that plural pops up in Genesis 11 as well. Let us make humanity. The word is azam in Hebrew. It, it doesn't mean man. It means people. It means humanity. If I want to say man in Hebrew, I can say it. The word is ish. That's not the word that's here. Right. Let us make azam. Let us make humanity in our image to resemble us so that they may take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the earth, including the creepy crawlies, even the remnants. Verse 27. God created humanity, human being, in God's own image. 
in the divine image, God created them. Male and female, God created them. Once again, this reveals why it is simply bad translation to render Adam here as man. Um, it is male and female that reflect the divine image in this world. God created humanity in God's own image. Now, I want you to notice something, friends. The diversity of the green world the diversity of the plant world is manifest by different kinds of plants. Plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit with seeds inside at each according to its kind. Each according to its kind. Similarly, the diversity of the world of birds and fish has to do with a variety of kinds, different kinds of bird, different kinds of fish, um, all the things that swarm in the waters according to its kind, all the winged birds according to its kind. And here it is, for land animals too, every kind of living thing, every kind of wildlife, every kind of livestock, every kind of rennet, every kind of creature that crawls on the ground. But there are no kinds of people. There are no kinds of people. The priests were not ignorant of race and culture and language. The Middle East was then as it still is today, a crossroads of civilizations. They were fully aware of Africans, the folk of Kush and Egypt, that were fully aware of Asians, they were fully aware of uh, the Philistines, uh, the sea peoples came out of the Aegean, they were Greek not culturally or linguistically, but that's the part of the world we're talking about there. They knew, they knew that people were of different shades and different cultures and different languages, but they don't say that there are, that God caused people to reproduce after their kind as though there were kinds of people. There are no kinds of people. The diversity of human being is not through a diversity of kind. So it's got to be a different kind of diversity, a different sort of variety. Note from Genesis 1 verses 28 through 31, God blessed them. God said to them, be fertile and multiply. Remember, that's what God told the birds and the fish too. And remember that when God created the plants, God made them a seed in them so that they were possessed of generativity, the power to bring forth new lives. And now God said that for humans as well. Be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth. Fill the earth. And master it. Take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, everything crawling on the ground. 
God saw everything God had made. It was supremely good. Up to now, God has said, uh, you know, tov. it was good, it was good, it was good. Now God says, Tov Ma'oz, very good, supremely good. By the way, this passage has often created problems in the Christian West by people who have misunderstood this text to mean that we are empowered to use up the world and to abuse the world to our own ends. Genesis 1 makes patently clear that that is not God's intent. Note that God has been saying that the world is good a long time before we get to the end of day six. The world is not good when it is good for human beings. God created the wild animals, too. God created the remes, too. Good heavens, God created the seeds. And God calls it all good. So good does not mean good for us. Good does not mean good for us. Good means that in God's own estimation, God regards what God has made as good. God, oh, good heavens. We say it when we read John 3, 16, the most quoted passage in scripture. You can say it with me. God so loved the world. God loves the world. And God loves the world in all its variety and diversity. And God's intent for human being is that we fill the earth and that we rule over the world as God's regents. And remember, we have been made in God's image, which means that God expects us to regard the world the way God regards the world. God expects us to love the world. God expects us to respect the world and to care for and tend the world. God's intent, God's purpose for human being is that we fill the earth. And keep in mind, in the garden story, uh, we can't stay in the garden. <laughs> God, God has planted a, a, a cherub a terrible otherworldly being with a flaming sword. Uh, we can't go back to Eden. And we can't stay there. Got to move on. Got to move out. Got to go to the place where God is going to send us. This brings us to Genesis 10. This comes at the end of the flood story. The ark has finally touched ground. The flood is over. The animals have scattered. And Noah and his family come out of the ark. Noah, remember, has three sons. Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Chapter 10 in Genesis describes the descendants of these persons. This map helps us to understand what Genesis 10 is visualized. Ham. Ham. Well, Ham means south. Well, it does not actually mean south, excuse me. But that's the interpretation that is given. The southern people. The people south of us. Us being Israel. Though those are the Hamites. And here they are all. The Kashluhim, the Lehavim, the people of Put, the people of Naftuhim, the people of Kush, the people of Mizraim, Mitzrayim, that is Egypt. Egypt. So Ham is south. 
all those folk down there. Jothis, that's the people up north. That's all the folk up there. Uh, Tarshish, Tiras, Yaven, Meshach, Magog, Gomer, Togarma, those folk in the north, the Ashkenaz, and the Madai, those people that live up there in the north. And then we come to Shem. We're aware of the term Semite. Sadly, we're often aware of that term because we're aware of anti-Semitism. Bill and I were talking just before uh, we all gathered for this study together, friends, remembering uh, Van Valto, who was a predecessor of mine teaching Hebrew Bible at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Von Valdo was a tank commander in the German army in World War II. He spent the rest of his life combating anti-Semitism and working to build bridges between Christians and Jews because he had seen the horrific the horrific carnage wrought by that racist dogma of hatred. Sem, Semite, they're us. They're our people. They're the people we're related to. And here they are. You're in the middle. Aram, the people of uh, the Arameans, the uh, the Syrians. You may be aware of the text in Deuteronomy where when uh, people bring their offering from the first fruits, they say a wandering Aramean was my father. That's Abraham. Aram, our people, but also uh, the people of Shinar, Yoktan, Havila, Mash, the Elamites, um, those middle people, the middle people. So the southerners, the northerners, and the middle people, the folk like us, the Shemites. I want you to note that the table of nations in Genesis 10 lays out God's intent, God's purpose for Ham, Shem, and Japheth, the sons of Noah. And it is no different than God's directive at the end of Genesis 1. Fill the earth. Fill the earth. And master it. And that is going to mean that in the process of filling the earth, you are going to diversify. You are going to differ from one another. And that is okay. In fact, that is my plan. That is my dream. That is my desire for you. That you find your variety, not in differing kinds, like the animals and the plants and the fish and the birds, but through discovering your oneness in the midst of and despite of were different. So, with Genesis 10 and Genesis 1 in our minds and those words of God in our ears, we can go back now to Genesis 11 and see what this sounds like. Now. All the people on earth had one language and the same words. They were all the same, and they wanted to keep it that way. That's why they built a city with a tower. Let's make a name for ourselves so that we won't be dispersed over all the earth. So that we won't be dispersed. Note that this is a direct violation, a direct opposition of God's expressed intent 
both in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, fill the earth, and that God's implied intent in Genesis 10, that description of the scattering of the children of Noah, Ham to the south, Japheth to the north, Shem to the middle regions of the world. What does God do? God came down to see the city and the tower the humans built. The Lord said, there is one people, they all have one language. And this wasn't what I meant. I didn't want them to all remain the same. I didn't want them to remain all in one place. Remember the end of chapter one again, fill the earth. Remember that chart the table of nations in chapter 10 fill the earth uh, they've accomplished this they're all together they're all the same and if i let them go who knows what will happen next but it won't be in accordance with my desire my design my dream and that is why <laughs> The Lord dispersed them from there over all the earth. The Lord dispersed them over all the earth. God accomplishes what had always been God's plan and purpose by fixing <laughs> up their language. It's named Babel because there the Lord mixed up Balal the languages of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over all the earth. Friends, last time we started here with this horrific scene that we all remember from January 6th. It was a mob it was an overwhelmingly white mob. It was a Christian nationalist mob. It was horrifying to see them smash into the Capitol, friends. But we shouldn't have been surprised because we've done it before. It has not been that long ago. It has not been that long ago. That people like these young white high school students, clean cut, decent guys, I have no doubt, could march with signs that said, we won't go to school with me, we strike against the integration of Clinton High. This is Reverend W.A. Criswell. It's not a particularly flattering picture. I decided not to find a flattering picture of the Reverend Criswell. Uh, Reverend William A. Criswell was the pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, which was in the 50s the largest Baptist church in the world. The picture comes from a newspaper article of him addressing a, a gathering in California. A, a conference on evangelism. God, help us. A conference on evangelism in California, at which Reverend Criswell said that the South should be left alone and blasted integration as idiocy. The quote that I have here, friends, comes from 1956. That's the year I was born. 1956, when Reverend Criswell was invited by the General Assembly of the South Carolina Legislature to address them 
on the subject of integration. Reverend Criswell said in part, he condemned scantling good for nothing fellows who are trying to upset all the things we love as good old Southern people and good old Southern Baptists. Don't force me by law, by statute, by Supreme Court decision to cross over in those intimate things where I don't want to go. Let me have my church, my church. Let me have my school. Let me have my friends. Friends, Reverend Chris Well could just as well have been speaking for the First Church of Babylon. The attitude of the people in Babylon was just that. Let's make a name for ourselves so we won't be dispersed over all the earth. We want to stay here with people we know. Let us have our church. Let us have our friends. Let us have our schools. We all want to be the same. We built this city so that we can stay the same. We built this tower so that we can stay the same. But the Lord said no. The Lord said no. The Lord dispersed them from there over all the earth. Last time, friends, I shared with you these words of Argentinian Methodist theologian Jose Miguez Bonino, his reflections on the Babel storm in Genesis 11. Bonino says, God's intention is a diverse humanity. And I want to suggest, friends, that Bonino is exactly right. Isn't that what we hear in Genesis 1? About God's desire, not just for the human world, but for all life on the world to experience difference and diversity and variety. The difference is that for the animals and the plants and the fish and the birds, that difference is a difference of kind. But God's dream for human beings is that we be diverse while still recognizing our commonality, our common heritage. God's intention is a diverse, a diverse humanity. Fill the earth. A diverse humanity. That's what Genesis 10 depicts with that table of nations, with all those weird and unpronounceable names. People scattered over what was to them all the known world. God's intention is a diverse humanity. It can find its unity not in the domination of one city, one tower, or one language, but in the blessing for all the families. This time we uh, explored our proposal about how to read Genesis 11, 1 through 9, the Babel story, by looking back, by looking at Genesis 1, by looking at Genesis 10. I'm going to share my screen again, friends. Next week, Next week, February 10th, we're going to explore this by moving forward. 
we're going to look at what I'm calling Babel's afterlife. <laughs> Two passages that, as we're going to see, build on or respond to the story of Babel in Genesis 11. The first is an unfamiliar one to many of us, I'm sure. Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. The second one is very familiar to us. We read it every year, every Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, 1 through 13. But next week, we're going to look at how those later texts pick up on the Babel story and perhaps reveal something more to us about Bonino's statement that God's intention is a diverse humanity. Now I'll stop my share. Um, let me check the, the, uh, the chat. Sandy Swansinger says, so even before we had to leave the garden, God had plans for people to disperse and fill the world. Um, yeah, certainly, uh, Genesis 1, um, which is a different account from uh, Genesis 2 and 3, that, uh, that other story of creation. But certainly, reading Genesis canonically, reading it now, um, before the garden story, before... Um, before uh, the uh, eating of the forbidden fruit, God's intention is for us to fill the earth. That's what God says to, uh, to the human in Genesis 1.28. And as, as we follow that through, as we follow that along, I think uh, the table of nations in Genesis 10, again, it's a it's a mind-blowingly boring passage. <laughs> and, and I do not condemn you for not having read it carefully. Truth to tell, I have not read it carefully. But the names that are found in there, the names in that table of nations, take us from the perspective of the authors of this text to the whole world all the world of which they knew. Their understanding was, this is what God wants. And keep in mind as well that an astonishing realization that there is only one humanity, only one human family. There are no kinds of people. I'm going to ask if anyone else has any... Oh, Kimberly Paglia asks if God's nature is for a diverse humanity and humanity was created in God's image, does this suggest that there is something diverse inherent in the nature of God? I think that's a marvelous observation. Uh, it makes me think I, I wish I wish my I could call up my colleague Edwin Van Dreel or my colleague Ron Cole Turner, or, or my colleague John Burgess, and have them hold forth on the Trinity. And the, the, the reason that Christians talk about God in Trinitarian terms, um, we do it because we have to. We do it because our experience of God compels us to it. The very first Christians believed passionately, fervently, that there is one God, and that the God of ancient Israel was the God that they had come to know and love. But they believed just as passionately, just as fervently, that God had shown all that God was in the person of Jesus. And the marvelous scene in the Gospels, friends, of Jesus praying Think on that. Jesus praying. Jesus is fully God as well as being fully human, and yet Jesus prays. God talking to God's self, so to speak. Keep in mind, 
that heartbreaking scene in Golgotha. When Jesus cries out from the cross in the words of Psalm 22, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even God forsakenness, God knows. Because of the diversity in God's self. Because Jesus is fully human, as well as fully divine. Um, I think there's a wonderful insight there, friends. Um, maybe our, our, our push for homogeneity and sameness winds up being not only, uh, not only a bad strategy for human relationships, but horrifically bad theology. It, it forces on God a bland sameness that God rejects, that is not true to who God is. Um, I'm looking at your faces. Uh, does anyone else have a question that you would like to pose? or a comment or a thought that you'd like to raise. Just uh, raise your hand, unmute, shout it out. Friends, let me ask you, does this make sense? This is uh, you know, quite a question, presentation. It is, I mean, all in, we all in a breed, we're all one group. I mean, it's all stupid. I'm sorry, pardon me? I didn't hear. Yeah, I think what is clear to me, and this has not always been clear to me, I can, I can hear myself in the back of my head telling classrooms of students and uh, preaching from the pulpit that uh, the uh, God's sending of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 and the, the gift of tongues removed the curse of Babel. I no longer think I can say that. I think Babel itself was the curse. Babel itself was the curse, and we imposed it on ourselves. It was not God's desire, and it is not God's desire that we remain all together and all the same. Uh, we learn from one another, from our differences, and exploring and delighting in that difference is perhaps yet another way in which we grow into that image of God in which we were created. Oh, God bless you, friends. I've, I've kept you over past our time. Uh, let me tell you that, uh, once again, if you want to do some homework for next time, uh, read that uh, last chapter of Zephaniah and the second chapter of Acts. Um, yeah, the the, the Zephaniah stuff may be somewhat tough sledding. And I'm betting that you'll read it and think, well, what the dickens does this have to do with Babel? And so I'm going to teach you some Hebrew next time <laughs> to help us to see some of the ways that in the Hebrew, there are resonances back to the Babel story in that text. Oh, friends, this is my joy. God bless you. So good to be with you. Bill, back to you. Thank you, good sir. Appreciate your time, effort, and energy and insight in all of this. Uh, so helpful to uh, think about this, especially in the times in which uh, we're living in so much confusion on these, uh, these issues. So thanks for helping us think through it and clarify that. May I dismiss this with just a brief prayer and see you all next week, God willing, and uh, uh, stay well till then. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thanks for the day. 
thanks for the promise of the night and for uh, the wonders of scripture and the way they challenge us and lead us uh, in this marvelous thing called the Christian faith. So um, for all this and even more, amen. Amen. God Thank bless you, you friends. Bless See you next Wednesday.